So, uh, good morning, uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to section second of the 31st Special CU uh, and the Asahi Glass Foundation. My name is uh, Assistant Professor Supan Sayon from Faculty of Medicine, Jilalongkorn University. And it's my pleasure to be the chairman of this session. Before we begin, I would like to um, announce some um, uh, housekeeping notes. We're going to present, um, we're going to have uh, six speakers, uh, and each in individual speaker will have total 15 minutes for presentation, or oh, sorry, 15 minutes in total, 10 minutes for presentations, and five minutes for Q&A. Um, so, um, well, we're going to um, have six presenter, uh, one, two, three, four, and the fifth speaker will come here by Zoom, and uh, the last one will have the video presentation. So, um, okay, so I think it's a good timing for Remind uh, to, to start, and we're gonna have the, the timer <laughs> here. So, <laughs> to remind the, our presenter, five minutes, and you and three minutes, and also one minute, so you have to wrap up. <laughs> Everything has to be done. Yep. So uh, we're gonna keep the time very tight to, um, you know, like we have so many exciting talk. Uh, now, uh, let's please welcome to our first presenter. Uh, the topic is uh, the ethanol as the extracting and reacting solvents for biodiesel production of the spent coffee grounds in the supercritical condition. And our presenter is Dr. Ryangwit uh, Sawang Gao from the Institute of Biotechnology and Genetic Engineering, Jilalongkorn University. Please welcome Dr. Ryangwit. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. And good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm happy to be here to share my research with you. OK, let's start quickly with the introduction why we select the spent coffee ground to be a substrate or raw material to produce the biodiesel because uh, I know someone working in the Starbucks coffee house so the sample is easy to find around the university and has quite constant quality and after we do the research we know that um, we can move to the instant coffee or ready to drink uh, coffee industrial because they have a lot of uh, spent coffee ground in their factories. And spent coffee ground has or contain around 10 to 30 percent by weight of the dry weight. And after we do the analysis of uh, sample, we know that uh, not only the lipid, uh, spent coffee ground contain uh, another valuable compound such as uh, hemicellular lignin and protein. And finally, the fatty acid profiles or content of fatty acid in spent coffee cow is like a palm oil, which is the raw material to produce the biodiesel in, the, in Thailand. So if we can produce the biodiesel from spent coffee cow, so it can be used as a biodiesel in Thailand. Then let's take a look at the conventional biodiesel production process. The raw material, such as animal fat or waste or plant oil, need to be extracted from the raw material. The extraction method, uh, like mechanical extraction or using a machine to squeeze the oil from the raw material, and then the remaining oil need to extract by the solvent extraction, like a hexane extraction, and then the solvent need to evaporate from the oil. So evaporation is the consume energy and cost a lot of money because you have to heat it up and then cool it down. So finally, the reaction, the reaction between the triglyceride or lipid with the alcohol using a catalyst and we got the biodiesel and glycerol as a product. And some downstream process like a catalyst removal, a purification, and finally we got biodiesel and glycerol. The idea of this research is replace all three steps by using ethanol extraction and uh, supercritical reaction. 
So we select ethanol because Thailand produce a lot amount of uh, ethanol each year, and we try to look for alternative way to use ethanol as a reactant for biodiesel production. And this is uh, our pressure temperature diagram for, for ethanol. Uh, I would like to give you information about the supercritical condition. Supercritical condition is the temperature and pressure above the critical point of ethanol, uh, 240 degrees Celsius and 6 megapascal. At this condition, ethanol is a reactive species. It can react with the triglyceride without using any catalyst. So uh, after we complete the reaction, the downstream process like uh, catalyst removal is eliminate. So we select the supercritical reaction to, to, to uh, produce the biology cells. And the methodology is very simple. First, we drying the spent coffee cow to prevent the formation of mold or fungi at the room temperature for 72 hours. And then we put in, uh, into the hot air oven for 24 hours to reduce the moisture from 50% to 5% to, to of moisture. And then we extract the sample by putting the spent coffee cow in the plastic drum and add some ethanol and waiting for 24 hours and replace the new spent coffee cow until the uh, ethanol or a saturate. Oops. And we do the kinetic study of the extraction in the small extractor as well. And as you can see, the 95.5% ethanol is, uh, has a lower efficiency for extract the oil when compared to the uh, anhydride ethanol. And the oil contain uh, triglyceride, fatty acid, monoglyceride. And then we do the experiment in the batch reactor. As you can see, this is a batch reactor. We put the oil and ethanol mixture into the reactor and put it in the fluid dye sand bath at the desired temperature. For example, at 300 degrees Celsius and 275. And re reaction take place. And after we complete the reaction, we cool down it in the water bath. And as you can see, the ester produced at this condition. And uh, at the longer reaction time, the raw material, triglyceride, diglyceride, is converted to ester. And then we move to the production in the continuous process. Oh, sorry. The result in the batch reactors show that when we increase the reaction time at 275, the ester contains still continuous increase. But at the 300 and 325, when we took a long re resident time or reaction time, the uh, fatty acid ester decreased because of the uh, degradation of ethylenolate, as you can see in the yellow, oops, orange. At 300 degrees Celsius, when we increase the reaction time, the ethylenolate that's sensitive to, to thermal degradation decreased. So we move to the continuous production in the continuous reactor. The mixture of ethanol and coffee oil were fed by the high pressure pump into the reactor. And at the exit, we had a heat exchanger to cool down the products and back pressure regulator to regulate the pressure inside the reactor around uh, 15 megapascal. And this is a photo of the reactor. This is a fluid ice sand bar. This is a cooler. And this is a back pressure regulator. OK. And the result from the continuous reactor show that no thermal degradation observed at 300 and 325 because the heating and behavior in, in a continuous reactor is quite different from the batch reactor. And this work 
uh, was presented in the fourth international conference on bioresource technology for bioenergy and bioproduct and environmental sustainability at uh, Lake Garda, Italy. And we invited to submit the manuscript in the special issue in next month. So the conclusion, um, we can produce the biodiesel or biofuel from spent coffee ground by using supercritical ethanol technology and the fatty acid profile of biodiesel produced from uh, SCG or spent coffee ground like palm oil. And uh, SCG oil is saturated in the anhydride and hydrate ethanol around just only 30 minutes. And the thermal degradation at uh, 300 degrees Celsius and 20 minutes in the battery reactor decreased the amount of uh, ethyl linoleate. And the maximum is the content of 83% was found in the continuous system. And ongoing work, we do the extraction of a coffee oil by using another solvent. And we found that in the coffee oil, not just only triglyceride, uh, it has a polyphenol or antioxidant. And we can separate them to add the value of the coffee oil. And after that, we try to extract another compound like a protein, a polysaccharide, and oil, and do do a valorization of the coffee oil. And finally, we do a life cycle assessment analysis to do the, to analyze, the, to measure the environmental impact of the products and the process as well. Thank you very much for uh, the Asahi Class Foundation for financial support, and thank you for your attention. Thank you for very much for, uh, for addressing uh, interesting topics. Uh, any bodies or any audience have any questions? Okay. Uh, thank, you very, thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. It was nice. Yes. First of all, I, I was very surprised that the oil content of coffee being ground is maximum 30 percent, you, you mentioned. Yes. So high level. I didn't know. <laughs> now my question is, the, uh, you compared with the mechanical extraction process and the ethan ethanol extraction process. And in case of the mechanical process, you talk about the energy consumption is very high. Yes. If you compare with the energy consumption between these two processes, yes. how much your process reduce the energy consumption? Um, actually, we do, we do the uh, mechanical extraction of spent coffee ground as well. The, um, because spent coffee ground contain a lot of water, we try to squeeze them uh, by using a screw press or the machine to squeeze uh, water and oil together. But in terms of energy consumption, um, actually mechanical, e mechanical extraction consume a less amount of energy because just Electricity, but but we, we not yet measure. But uh, the most energy consumption for uh, per se the spent coffee cup is evaporated water because they has up to fifty percent of water. Yes. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so we're gonna move to uh, the next presenter. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome. Dr. Chayabut Ariyache to present his research topic, which is development of personalized three-dimensional organoids for studying and testing bioactivities of Thai herb-derived compounds. <coughs> Welcome, Dr. Chayabut. Uh, thank you, Tasman Sa, for the introduction. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Chayabut Ariyache. I'm a lecturer at the Department of Biochemistry, Faculty of Medicine, Chulalongkorn University. Uh, today is my great pleasure to uh, share a story of my project with everyone today. And the goal of the study is to develop a liver organoids as a platform to identify compounds uh, from Thai herbs for the treatment of the liver fibrosis. 
So what are the organoids? Uh, organoids are the mini version or the mini version of the real organs that uh, can be cultured. Um, the tissue can be harvested uh, and be cultured in the three-dimensional structure as an organoid. And they could be propagated and uh, be used as the uh, for therapeutics or and disease models as well as uh, to study uh, the development of the human organs. So in contrast to the conventional uh, 2D culture system, the 3D organoids can recapitulate the general aspect of the um, architecture of the tissue and also the functional aspect of the, uh, the real organs. And while maintaining uh, the genetic stability uh, for years, so um, if we testing the drug uh, with the organoids, uh, will yield a more accurate uh, drug response and the prediction than the conventional 2D culture system. So for this project, uh, we aim to identify the new compounds that can be used for the treatment of the liver fibrosis, uh, which is the uh, caused by the liver fibrosis caused by the excessive accumulation of the collagen in the liver tissue forming the fibrotic scar. And this fibrotic scar block uh, the liver function and disrupt the tissue arch architecture uh, and lead to the organ failure and death. And so far, uh, currently, there's no, um, um, there's no effective uh, therapy for the uh, liver fibrosis. Okay. Two cell types uh, in the liver that are involved in the process of the liver fibrosis, including hepatocyte, and hepatic stress cells. So while performing um, several important metabolic functions, hepatocyte can be injured by the fat uh, accumulation and the drug overdose. And this damaged hepatocyte could activate the hepatic stress cell to produce a large amount of the collagen and then cause the liver fibrosis. So to um, in, uh, to generate the model, organoid model of the liver fibrosis uh, in vitro. So first, I establish a protocol of generating the liver organoid, uh, co-culture liver organoid uh, of hepatocyte and hepatic cell cell uh, in vitro. So basically, um, the two cell types were cultured in the two uh, in the low attachment place, and in the, in the formulated culture media that allow to promote the cell assembly into the 3D structure of organoids. And then I, uh, I harvested these organoids and analyzed for their cellular composition uh, by the immunofluorescent. And you, as you can see here, um, the two cell type, which has the known marker for each uh, cell type, they show that these two cell types are intermingled, where the hepatic cell cell tend to uh, cluster in the middle of the organoid. Then to induce fibrosis in the organoid, I, uh, I start from adding the palmitic acid, uh, in short, a PA. And um, this palmitic acid is a type of fatty acid that commonly found in the high fat diet food. And we found that the accumulation, uh, the, high, the, high, uh, the, high, the high amount of the of, uh, palmitic acid causes the lipid accumulation of the lipid doublet uh, inside the organoid. And accordingly, uh, when we analyze the amount of the collagen in the organoid treated with the palmitic acid, it shows the higher levels of the collagen deposition. In addition, we perform the qPCR analysis to uh, survey the expression of the fibrotic genes, including those collagen genes, and found that there's application of the uh, fibrotic genes upon the palmitic acid treatment. As we successfully uh, uh, induced the fibrosis using the high fat diet model, then we want to uh, create another, the second model of the fibrosis organoid by uh, the drug overdose. So we used the acetaminophen or uh, paracetamol as, a, as an inducer for the, to induce the fibrosis as this drug uh, as it's, uh, it's commonly uh, overdose of this uh, acetaminophen is commonly found in the hospitals. And overdose of the, this drug 
uh, cause the uh, hepatocyte toxicity, uh, toxicity as, you, as indicated by the uh, MTT, assay, uh, MTT assay. And this uh, damage uh, caused the organoid to accumulate more um, uh, collagen, as you can see in the, by the collagen one staining. And accordingly, uh, upon the treatment of the acetaminophen, the induction of those fibrotic gene markers were upregulated. So as we can, as these two, these two pieces of data show that uh, we can recapitulate a process of liver fibrosis in vitro in using our organoid model. To identify, uh, as we can establish a model, then the next question is to find the potential anti-fibrotic compounds. So we started from a list uh, of the, uh, of the uh, nine herbs that uh, were known to improve the liver function from the Thailand National List of Essential Medicines. We prepare uh, the crude extract and um, treat this extract into the culture of the hepatocyte that grown in the high fat condition. And so then we, assay, uh, we uh, determine the amount of the fat uh, accumulation uh, by uh, counting the number of the lipid doppers inside the cell. We found that like uh, out of nine herbs, three of them as highlighted in yellow uh, can reduce the number of the lipid doppers greater than 50% in comparison with the untreated control. So we hypothesize that, that some molecule or compound inside this, crude, this three crude extract could have the anti-fibrotic uh, act activities. So for the current experiment, uh, we are testing if this, uh, the, comp uh, the, this three, uh, the, the crude extract from these three, com uh, three uh, herbs uh, can have the anti-fibrotic anti potential in, the liver in our liver organoid models. And then we try to identify the molecules that, uh, inside the crude extract that could uh, have the and uh, could reduce the fibrosis in the liver organoid. And finally, we would like to uh, validate the result in the mouse model of the liver uh, in the uh, in the mouse model of the liver fibrosis. So ultimately, we hope that uh, the result from this experiment could yield a new therapeutics for the treatment of the liver fibrosis. So finally, I would like to thank my senior mentor, Dr. Pisit Tangkitwanit, and uh, Asa Hitas Foundation for the funding, and everyone here for your attention, and I'm happy to take any question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Um, Dr. Chayabud. Yeah. So any audience have a question? It's very uh, wonderful talk, and um, it's like, Okay, I shouldn't eat any fatty oil. <laughs> Anybody <laughs> else is like, okay, oh my God. yeah. So, um, anybody has any questions? Uh, doctor, thank you very much. Uh, I, I thought uh, this study is uh, very variable for everyone. Uh, uh, but I'm sorry, I, I am not an uh, expert of this field, so my question is uh, too, too fundamental. But uh, and you are using uh, uh, three dimensional organ uh, organite organite to uh, to um, to make a sample to test a sample, uh, but uh, is there any uh, technical problem to to make such a uh, to, to such a reliable sample for medical test? Yeah, uh, I am an I am an engineer, so I am interested in how to make uh, three dimensional organite, which is uh, which is reliable for your study. Um, so if I understand correctly how you're asking, like how to produce, yeah, yes. to make this organoid like a large, yes, yes. And large you, quantity. You are, making, yes, you are using 3D, 3D, 3D yeah. organ, organoids. Yes. So, uh, I, I'm wondering if uh, the, those, um, the making a method of such an uh, artif artificial organoid. Uh, may need technical, uh, technical, special uh, technical. Oh, okay. So I'm yeah. How, what the technology, what the technology are you using? Okay. So, actually, the cell are quite smart in terms of like they know how to do the. So if you put them together, if you give them the, they have, they can send the signal to each other, and then they can self assemble. Uh, they can do the self assembly 
into the 3D uh, structure by itself. We don't have to give them special like uh, instruction, but we have to put them in the right med uh, in the right medium condition, which is like the it's like the where they live. So if we give them the like, the right amount of nutrients, then they can somehow know each other and then form automatically. You don't need to you don't need to tell them or, or push them to to form. But if they are if they are in the right condition, if they are happy. They can send the signal to each other and and sell and just do the but they just like form the three organoid by itself. This is uh, it has been proved like by several lab that um, the cell are pretty smart and they are they know that like okay we are the we belong together like we are like in the same or we are we are same cell type in the same organ we used to live together and they tend to like come together form an organoid. Yeah, yep. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, for for my, uh, I'm just kind of wondering about the the herb that you take is for prevention or for healing. So you if you uh, mix the the medication or the herb after it's sick, the organoid gets sick. So it's kind of like recovering it, right? So I, I don't know like what aspect that you wanna try. Um, I I guess we can do both like in terms of the prevention yeah. and also the treatment. So if you like add the, the, the crude extract or the compound before right. adding the fat, that's, that's for the, the prevention, right? right? That's a testing for the prevention. To make but it healthy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When, when, yeah, when healthy, right? we, but we want to eat lots of fat, right? But, yes. but we don't want to get fat. <laughs> so that, that's, that's a part of testing for the, uh, <laughs> for the prevention. But we can also do for the treatment as well. Like we, uh, we can treat the organoid with the fatty acid first, bombard them with like, tons mm -hmm. of fat, and then they'll get lots Reverse, of fat. Yeah. yeah, and they become the fibrosis, right? And then we add the compound <laughs> to see if you can reverse the process. Yeah. Okay. I wait for that because I love hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> so. Thank you for the questions. Okay. Um, I think we're going to move to uh, the next speaker. Um, I would like to, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Sh uh, Assistant Professor uh, Dr. Thanaton Khotwi Watana to present his research, uh, which is the development of novel curumarin derivatives as an anti cancer agent. Is welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the nice okay. <coughs> introduction. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Asahi Glass Foundation for giving us opportun opportunity to investigate on this uh, analogs. So first of all, for oops, sorry. Okay. First of all, this is the outline of this talk. I will start by uh, talking about why we are interested in furocumarin, and then I will talk about the synthesis and bioactivity of these compounds, and finally I will talk about the summary and future plan of this project. First of all, you may know that uh, cancer is such a devastating disease. Uh, the death rate continues to grow over the year, and at the moment the, the effectiveness of chemotherapy has been increased, but uh, nevertheless the it's still not that effective and you still have lots of side effects like fatigue and many other side effects. So we probably need to uh, invent the new uh, compounds or drugs that have even better uh, activity and as, as well as having less toxicity. Therefore, we looked at this compound called furocumarin. This is the core structure, but they have lots of derivatives like uh, with substituents on the outside ring. Uh, this compound has been used as PUVA or Thorin uh, Ultraviolet A treatment for the treatment of skin disease as well as uh, skin cancer. However, by itself, it's also caused skin cancer. <laughs> and apart from that, there was some literature reporting that it can bind to the HER2 enzyme upon UVA irradiation to covalently bind to HER2 enzyme. So this enzyme is found overexpressed in various types of breast cancer. So it can be used as both skin cancer treatment and breast cancer treatment in the, in the combination with, with UVA. Apart from that, later on, they found that upon uh, derivatizing the core structure a little bit with substituents, it also show anti-cancer activity without UVA. So by itself, it can kill various cancer cells. So here is some literature review Many people uh, derivatize the compound by varying R1 and this met met methyl group 
at number five and number eight positions. And as you can see, um, these two compounds show very high uh, anti-cancer activity against MCF7, which is the breast cancer cell. And these are amides and amine derivatives. Uh, the other derivative doesn't show this much activity. However, in the research, there are, there are only like in total five compounds in this category have been synthesized. Therefore, uh, it hasn't been fully uh, investigated yet. That's, the uh, that's our goal of this study. We are trying to uh, explore more of the C5 substituents to find even better compounds. So here comes our synthesis. This was done by my master student who has already graduated, Miu. Um, she synthesized 34 analogs and fully characterized all of them by a three-step process, starting from 8-MOP. So this one is nitrated in a good yield and then uh, reduced to amine. And this one is then undergo either ac acylation, alkylation, or many other things um, to give around 10 amine analogs and 10, 20 amine analogs, and also sulfonamides and thiourea. So we have 34 analogs in total. Most of them were novel, which means no one has ever been synthesized them before. So for amines, we also get both uh, mono-substituent and disubstituted compound. So after that, we also collaborated with Julapon Research Institute. Uh, Dr. Judhatip, Dr. Suripon, and Dr. Kriang Sak, who uh, provided us with uh, the assays for testing against eight cancer cell lines with an, also an, a normal cell line as well. Apart from that, we also checked for the, uh, the chemo prevention activity as well, apart from the curing. So this is, uh, I cut part of the table. Actually, it's much bigger than this, but these uh, we got some of the like you know the best compound, the best candidate so far. You can see this is the IC50 in to, uh, in the unit of micromolar. IC50 stands for the uh, inhibition concentration at which it can inhibit 50% of the cancer activity. So the lower the concentration, the more effective the compound. So you can see this compound 4N has the IC50 against HeLa cell of 0 0.07 micromolar, which is around 70 nanomolar. This is 100,000 times more effective than tamoxifen, which is the currently used uh, anti-cancer drug at the moment, and uh, better than the other two, like uh, lapatinib and other things as well. So apart from that, we also established structure activity relationship, which is the, you know, the relationship between the type of substituents upon the activity of the cancer, which we also report in uh, our study as well. But I won't go into much detail because of the limited amount of time. Uh, apart from that, uh, the same group also checking on the mechanistic study. They use our best compound comparing with the 8-MOP, the, the one without uh, any substituent. And we found that by checking the apoptotic, uh, apoptosis assay, we found that the compound actually killed the cancer cell via apoptotic pathway. And using the cell cycle analysis, we show that the compound uh, in, introduced the G2M phase arrest. So the cancer cell is like, you know, stopped by this G2M phase. And upon looking at the cell morphology, we also show that the compound actually introduced the apoptotic character in the cancer cell. So going back to the activity, apart from uh, the one that we report, which was the under no UVA, we also check uh, whether our compound has phototoxicity. So by treating the compound in, with the cancer cell in the dark or under UVA irradiation at 12.5 uh, minutes. This was done at uh, Suranari uh, in, uh, university with Dr. Anyani and Ms. Sirilak. As you can see, uh, the amine analogs uh, show very high phototoxicity and it has very high selectivity. So you can, you can see that uh, the SKBR3 
is the one, the cancer, the breast cancer that has uh, HER2 overexpression, which is the enzyme that uh, has been reported that this compound is inhibiting on. But MDA MB231, this one is uh, the cell line that doesn't express HER2. So you can see that uh, it only is selective towards the HER2 positive cell lines. Apart from that, uh, without any light, without any UVA, there was no activity at all. So this kind of be, uh, suggests that it, it would be uh, interesting for you know, targeted chemotherapy or something like for breast cancer cell. And the activity is around two micromolar, which is still not that low, but remark uh, is significant enough for further study. Apart from that, we also, oops, sorry. We also look at uh, some, use some computational study to help us investigate on the mechanism of action. Uh, on the HER2 enzyme, we introduce our uh, compound at the active site of the, of the enzyme. And then we found that uh, the best compound here show much better interaction compared to the under compound. So this one has minus 7.9 kilocal per mole, but this one is minus 9.4 kilocal per mole. So it binds stronger to the HER2 enzyme. This was done by Dr. Ruchita. And we also investigated on other target as well to see whether uh, this compound is inhibiting uh, other enzymes or not. So in, to in, in summary, uh, we have published one international publication at Tier 1 uh, on our, the phototoxicity and the HER2 positive cancer selectivity and the molecular docking study. So this one has been published. And we are looking forward to publish another one on the HeLa cytotoxicity, the one that we got 70 nanomolar, and also the other mechanistic studies on these, enzyme, uh, on these compounds and also the target fishing, which use computational study to help. So I th I'd like to thank Asahi Glass Foundation for giving us opportunity to investigate on this uh, project and also thank all of my students for investigating, uh, help helping us uh, to get this result. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Tanatan, with your excellent talk. Uh, anybody has any questions about yeah, cancer treatment? Thank you so much. Very interesting. So I think you designed and synthesized the uh, solarine derivatives. Yes. And also you analyzed the uh, effectiveness on cancer. Yes. So my question is, the, uh, finally, uh, have you found some rule or theory of the effectiveness on cancer. Uh, you mean uh, whether we yeah. find a like, good candidate for treatment Cat of cancer? Or? So generally, it is very difficult to design the drug ah, itself. I see. So you if know, you can rule. find some rule or theory, it mm -hmm. could be very excellent. So that's my question. Yeah, that's a very nice question. So here is the structure activity relationship or SAR study. This one is to analyze the relationship between the structure and the anti-cancer activity. So we use this SAR study to feed into the design of the uh, newer analogs to improve it even further. So from here, we learn a lot by like, you know, some groups can help increasing the activity. Some group doesn't have any effectiveness. So from this star study, we can learn uh, a few things. Apart from this star study, we also collaborate with uh, Dr. Ruchita from, uh, from C CTA. So she also used uh, computational chemistry, QSAR, or quantitative structure relationship, uh, activity relationship. For that one, it's more accurate than, than SAR. This one we you know, analyze by our feeling. But for that one, they use some uh, computational descriptors to match the, the structure with the activity. So from that one, we can also learn uh, the model as well. We have a few more minutes, if anybody, uh, okay. Uh, thank you, thank you for your nice presentation. Yeah, and, uh, yeah I, I, I can uh, identify the Hokumarin. Hokumarin is very effective for um, detecting uh, cancer, uh, like uh, and, uh, in, inside the body. 
、uh, but my question is、uh, very simple.、Uh, if if uh, in the near future, how,、uh, and, and how do you deli、uh, deliver、uh, for Kumari inside the body? Yeah, currently, you are using the cell line、mm. for,、uh, for study, but in the near future, how do you, how do you deliver for Kumari into our body? <laughs> That's a very good、uh, question as well. So,、uh, in terms of drug development pipeline,、uh, at the moment we started on drug di discovery, which is focusing on the im improving the effectiveness of the drug against the enzymes or the cell. However, apart, once we got some, our, some of our lead compound, we need to look at its drug likeliness properties, which is the pharmacokinetic properties of the drug, whether it can ab be absorbed. Whether it can be like will be metabolized or excreted from our body, so upon looking on that, we actually we already did some prediction of those ADME property, and these compounds are、uh, seem to be okay, but we haven't tested in animal models yet. So our next step is to move on to the mouse model, for example, to to see whether our compound can be introduced, whether orally or injection. Or if it cannot be delivered orally, do we have any other modes of,、uh, you know, delivery process? Like you know, some drug de delivery, uh, like uh, technologies, like you know, nanoparticles, liposome, and many other things. So that one will be investigated investigated in the future. Thank you very much. I am expecting、uh, the progress you are studying more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We're going to move to the next presenter. He's from the Department of Chemistry as well.、Um, please welcome Dr. Chanat Onbangkane. He's going to present his research、uh, in topic of a novel strategy for studying and treating Alzheimer's disease using protein dimerizations. Please welcome. Hello. Okay.、Uh, good. Good morning, everyone.、Uh, thank you for、uh, a nice, you know, opportunity、uh, for me to receive the Asahi Glass Foundation、um, last year to support my、uh, research program、uh, on this topic.、Uh, my lab, in general,、uh, is interested in、uh, studying Alzheimer's disease,、uh, which is、uh, an important disease that's emerging now, especially in aging society. Uh, globally, okay. So、uh, the topic that uh, um, I will talk about,、um, actually, this one、uh, is going to be a new uh, strategy um, to investigate the. Sorry, is it like moving? Okay,、uh, it's going to study the、uh, Alzheimer's disease、uh, mechanism or finding a new way to.、Oh, To cure the disease、um, by using the protein dimerization technique, which is、uh, my expertise that I、uh, did during my PhD.、Um, but uh, while we are、um, trying to establish this uh, platform, um, we have to find a, a way to detect the abnormal protein, which is、uh, the which is called the tau protein in、uh, in the, in this、um, disease. So.、Uh, The the work that I'm going to present first、um, that I I made more progress、um, on on the detection of the tau protein, which is you know the main cause of Alzheimer's disease, using this、uh, small molecule、uh, of fluorescent dye called styrene indole、uh, fluorescent dye.、Uh, upon the binding to the tau aggregate, which is the the main cause of the Alzheimer's disease in in inside of cells,、uh, it will give the signal strong fluorescent signal, and so that we can、uh, see if、uh, the cells you know have like some abnormal protein such as tau. So I'm going to present this one、uh, first while we are you know investigating the other the other technique、um, to to establish the the new way to heal the dis、uh, the Alzheimer's disease. Okay. The outline is the, the introduction,、um, the objectives,、uh, some of the results, and the conclusion. So, as、uh, we all know, that you know, Alzheimer's disease、uh, has become the main、uh, burden of the economics and you know the societies、uh, globally. So, especially in aging society,、um, like you know, Japan has has already、uh, become an aging society,、uh, and Thailand is you know going there as well. So.、Um, That this prompts the investigation of the、uh, Alzheimer's disease because you know、uh, if we cannot find a, a way to cure it, it will be a disaster. 
So um, we have to look at the mechanism of the disease. So now uh, we know that you know these two proteins are the main cause of the disease, and I'm uh, interested in tau proteins. So tau protein is uh, um, a protein that's um, localized on microtubules in the cells, and it serves as a scaffold to uh, have you know normal function inside of cells. But once you know the tau is hyperphosphorylated, which is the the process inside of cells that it's still unclear like, uh, how it happens. Um, the tau form, you know, uh, dissociates from the microtubules um, and you know form the oligomers and eventually forms the aggregates inside the cells and causing the neural death, you know, in our brain. So this is the you know knowledge and understandings in terms of the mechanisms that we we know uh, to date. So. Uh, the, the key step is that the hypophosphorylation of tau proteins causing the microtubule uh, destabilization and form the oligomers or aggregates inside the cells and eventually causing the cell death. Um, in the present, now we uh, have a way to diagnose this uh, Alzheimer's disease uh, using the Im brain imaging techniques, but uh, like you know, uh, CT, X-ray, and P PET or PET. Uh, which is the standard uh, techniques that we, we use to diagnose this disease. But uh, these te imaging techniques are, are very expensive and, um, you know, like sometimes it uh, cannot be, it, it's not like so accessible by, um, you know, general patients. So you have to uh, have like some uh, money and, you know, connection to get like this uh, technique performed. Usually like doctors will not you know, perform this technique right away until you have like a very progressive uh, disease, like very clear that you might have Alzheimer and then uh, the doctors will use this technique to confirm it. But that's gonna be very too, uh, like too late, you know, to cure the disease. Once the disease occurs, uh, it will be progressive like for, for many years and uh, it's very difficult or like nowadays we don't have a, a way to reverse it or to cure it yet. So uh, the goal of this project is to find a new way to you know, detect the, the Alzheimer disease causing proteins uh, at an early stage, like uh, tau, uh, abnormal tau proteins. So usually um, we can, in, in research, we can use um, some of these compounds, which are the polyanionic um, compounds to uh, detect the, uh, to induce the aggregates um, to to have the tau aggregates inside the cells. So we can use this technique to induce the aggregates uh, in our experiments, and then um, we can use you know the fluorescent uh, compounds to bind to the tau aggregates in in our experiments and see the the signal uh, or like you know we uh, we can use it uh, in histology uh, standing as well um, to to see. Um, the, the, the abnormality of the cells. Um, but uh, normally the fluorescent compounds cannot penetrate uh, into the cell very well, so we, we have to find you know, new dyes that uh, are red, more redshifted or you know, can be excited in a longer wavelength so that we can use you know, red uh, fluorescent laser or some of the near IR um, near infrared fluorescent dye uh, to activate the dye and get the signal when uh, they bind to the tau aggregates. So we decided to uh, use um, the scaffold, which is called the indostyreal dye, which is a red shifted dye that uh, can, you know, uh, bind to tau aggregates uh, based on the previous uh, studies that you know these uh, types of uh, structures can you know, bind specifically to the tau uh, or protein aggregates uh, very well. So we synthesize uh, some derivatives um, uh, shown here, and we uh, use the tau aggregation assay in vitro um, to induce the aggregates, tau aggregates using heparin, uh, which is an anionic um, species, um, to induce the tau aggregates, and then we uh, add the, the fluorescent dye that we synthesize, and see we can see the uh, fluorescent increase um, upon the binding to aggregates. And we uh, studied, uh, try uh, all of the dyes that we have had in hand, and we found that you know, this uh, compound uh, 2B 
gave us the, the highest, you know, for a cent increase. This is a full increase, um, the, the, the most uh, prominent, and we will uh, investigate further uh, how we can use these uh, fluorescent dyes to um, detect the tau aggregates in, in the cells. Um, so before we go into the cells, we have to make sure that uh, these compounds are not uh, cytotoxic so, so that you know, it can get into the cells and just bind to the tau aggregates proteins and um, not causing the cell death by itself. So we found that this, also this compound to be, give us a, a decent uh, you know, cell viability. So we use this compound to investigate um, the tau protein de detection inside the living cells um, shown here. So this is the DAPI staining uh, that shows the nucleus of the cells and the tau GFP that, uh, that is in green. So these are the proteins that, um, uh, the tau protein that gives a signal um, inside the cells. Um, and then we have the dye which is shown in red, um, showing that you know, the dye can get into the cells, not cytotoxic, and you know, stain um, the proteins uh, similarly to the, the tau GFP. So this is uh, still you know, under investigation, and uh, we will uh, go, go on and continue to uh, study and try to uh, develop the fluorescent dye that can be used uh, in the clinical uh, studies, um, such as you know, detecting the tau proteins in the CSF or the uh, cerebral spinal fluid uh, samples that we have a collaboration in the, with the medical school in, at uh, Chula Longkorn as well. So uh, lastly, I would like to thank Chula Longkorn University and uh, the Asahi Class Foundation for the funding and the support um, throughout my research program. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Tanat. Okay, Dr. Shin. So, anybody had a questions? So, we have a few more minutes for um, have a questions. Anybody? Okay, so, Dr. Hide Fumi. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for um, the valuable uh, presentation for us. Yeah, yeah, I thought that this study would lead to uh, the to to lead to to actualize uh, uh, heal uh, Alzheimer's disease <laughs> in the near future. And, but uh, my uh, question is very um, maybe simple. Um, to, you are using fluorescence fluorescence uh, for detection uh, yes. for detection. But uh, uh, to, yeah, now uh, uh, if uh, if we, if your technology will be uh, to, will be uh, applied for uh, the inside. Inside uh, head, how do you detect <laughs> fluorescence uh, from? Uh, how how do you how do you uh, detect fluore fluorescence uh, from inside head? Yeah, uh, that's that's gonna be. This is a very uh, challenging task. Um, the normally the fluorescence uh, cannot be detected inside the the, the brain. Um, uh, so that that's the the difficulty. Uh, we the goal of this uh, study we will try to detect the protein in you know the the fluid like uh, spinal fluid or the blood. That's the the, the ultimate goal. So you know, once the the protein you know aggregates occurs, uh, there will be some uh, that that's you know excreted or you know exported to outside of the cells. Uh, into the spinal fluid or the blood system. So we will try to use our fluorescent uh, dyes to detect uh, abnormal protein in, in, you know, outside of the brain. Yeah, but actually the fluorescent dye, uh, especially the near IR dyes, um, now, you know, doctors can, can use it to, to detect some signal as well, but you have to do the surgery, the brain, you know, opening the brain. And, and you know, try to use the laser to excite and see. But that's still on kind of like the surface, not deep inside the tissue. So that's, that's the, the challenging uh, technique as well. And it's also invasive, so nobody wants to you know, get the brain you know, open, the skull <laughs> open, right? <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. But if this uh, you know possible, we can detect the tau aggregates in, in the blood. That that will be very helpful and much cheaper than you know other imaging techniques. Okay. Sounds I get it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful. Uh, now I think um, the the fifth presenter.
uh, going to be in Zoom. Uh, as well as Professor Dr. Jitima Lakhanakun. So everybody uh, uh, here, do you hear? Yeah, just uh, turn on the microphone. Sounds great. Yes. So now we're going to move to the, the, the faculty of pharmaceutical science. So we heard from engineering school, we heard from the science, and now we will uh, shift a little bit to, to pharmaceutical science. Um, okay, so the slide is here, okay. Uh, now, um, uh, I would like to welcome Associate Professor Dr. Jitima Lakhanakun to present her research in the topic of um, development of targetable virus-like particles for delivery of biological macromolecules for immunotherapy. Please welcome. Hi, um, I'm sorry that um, I have to be on Zoom um, since I'm away from Thailand for a conference. So my name is Jitima Lakhanakun and uh, also my postdoc that is uh, very much involved in the project is Cha Dr. Chavi Laumipon. So I will be presenting for um, the group and uh, the outline of this talk will be touched based on the virus-like particle and polyvalency on how we think of virus as the materials for uh, drug and, and vaccine or genes delivery. And also the concept of the ASI functionalized VLP or virus-like particle and the production processes. Also the metabolic pathway of azido sugar with the um, HIV-1 assembly in mammalian cells that will be the process of how we produce the VLP as the um, delivery systems. And the production of VLP and the particle characterization for physical chemical property of the particles. Also the cellular uptake and uptake mechanism of the VLP into the cells in order to get the bioactivities that we, uh, we, we uh, expected. And also lastly, we are going to uh, touch a little bit on the antibody conjugation uh, as the proof of concept and the targeting delivery approach. So this idea has based on, um, sorry, the slide is not going. Okay, um, we have originally um, uh, showcased our uh, idea on the integrative biology. And uh, this is just uh, um, one of the, um uh origin original idea that that we um ha started in our lab um so let me tell you about um how vlp can um or virus like particle or the virus particle itself can uh provide the the powerful tools for pharmaceutical um usage so we start off with the polyvalency which with the um, very basic molecular biology where uh, multivalency is a key principle in nature already. So we try to mimic, um, you know, all the science and all the inventions um, started from uh, how we look at uh, nature and how we study the nature and adapt the, the idea from, you know, a natural materials to uh, build the new materials or build new functional materials. So we look at the, um, you know, multivalency as the, uh, the inspiration uh, we had from um, the plants uh, called um, this bird and, the, you know, it's the grass plant that when you walk into the uh, grass field and it sticks to your um uh, to your socks or to your trousers or to your pants. So this um, uh, this flower right here has a lot of uh, spikes, right? So this is the concept of uh, Velcro technology that uh, is, was patented years, many years back, where um, they design uh, hook and loops that, you know, uh, they're there must be many hooks and many loops in order to get a uh, stick together um, and also get the strong but reversible interaction. So this is the multiple points of uh, interaction, but not a permanent interaction. So this multiple point of contact and interaction can give a very strong um, adhesion or strong interaction between the two materials uh, that can stick together. So the same idea with the virus, uh, when they invade the um, 
you know, the cells, the whole cells, like the bacteria cells. For example, the picture on the left here, um, let me use. So here is the, the good example of the, um, the phage. Phage means the virus that um, invade the bacteria. So it has the bacteria as its host. Um, so when it integrate into a bacteria, so it needs the multiple contact points, uh, the surface of the virus will have the, you know, motif that can bind to multiple points of the receptors on the surface of the host cells. Um, in pharmaceutical um, delivery system or design of the pharmaceutical delivery system, we try to mimic that um, behavior in order to find a drug to block the invasion of the virus into the cells. So this is the normal um, attachment of the virus on the surface of the cells. This is the, uh, the cartoon just to represent how the um, mechanism of the, the, of the virus binding on the surface of the cells and integration of the virus. So if we were able to block um, you know, all these uh, virus contact points to the receptor of the cells, then you could possibly um, uh, slow down the binding a little bit. But if it, it was the small molecule that only plugs in, you know, one by one and block, um, you know, the receptor on the surface one by one. However, if you have the polyvalency materials, like many motifs or many um, molecules that can um, be on one uh, platform or one scaffold that structure to you know cluster together so you try to you are increasing the uh, local concentration of the the uh, molecules that will block the binding and also the chance of you know um, molecular binding on the virus is higher and also is more structured then with this uh, multivalency or polyvalency will help um, uh, increase the effectiveness of the, the blockage. So this is the uh, example. And also when you design the um, you know, cluster of polyvalency materials, you need a, somewhat a, a, a control over the distance between the two ligands that you want to design. So this is a key point on um, that will take over why we are interested in using virus as the, you know, a scaffold for uh, polyvalency uh, bindings. So um, this is to summarize the um, good about viruses in um, materials or pharmaceutical materials. So viruses are naturally occurring biomolecule that can self-assemble into particles. Um, you know, we are in the, I am one of the um, nanotechnology uh, the chemist or uh, scientist that always seeks for the way, the best way to produce or to replicate the nanomaterial, which is not easy. Everyone knows that, you know, making nanomaterials uh, to get the good homogeneity or good control over the production is really, really tough. So, but virus can do it very easily because it's the nat natural, um, uh, natural scheme, natural process um, that, you know, the virus has been created um, by itself and it self-assembled as a biomolecules um, by the, the beauty or the, the design of, of nature. And uh, uh, the viruses are, um, you know, in can be in the nanometer scales, which uh, can be used, of course, in um, nano design of the materials and the pharmaceutical uh, delivery. And the virus capsid and its envelopes um, are mostly well structured and very strong, very um, uh, very stable, and uh, it is functionalizable with the polyvalency that we we expect. And uh, you know we only use the viral code protein if we don't want to use the whole virus and its genetic materials. However, its genetic material or genomic materials of the virus can be a very powerful tools for functionalization of the virus, or it can be a powerful tool to, um, to design the production scheme. Uh, for example, if, um, if you want the some molecules on the surface of the virus that is not a natural molecules um, 
you can design the protein that will be expressed on the surface of the virus with the genomic um, uh, process. For example, you can adapt or you can uh, modify genes for the virus that has code protein in order for them to replicate and present the unnatural amino acids on its surface. And that can be, you know, you can build a plasmid and uh, you can um, integrate the plasmid onto the, into the whole cells of the virus and, and culture that uh, virus and the system, then you get you know, a bunch of the virus that show the unnatural uh, molecules that you you design or you want um, simultaneously without, you know, chemical modification. And also the viruses are monodispersed in structures. And it, it is, um, you know, you can do the mass production of the virus uh, with, you know, well-controlled um, size and well controlled structures of uh, nanomaterial production. And it could deliver the genome in whole cells, of course, because it, that's uh, how the virus works. And uh, we can use the viruses in many uh, different ways. First, you can use the whole virus as the virus, like with the um, a code protein and also its genetic materials inside them. For example, we can use the cowpea mosaic virus. This is a plant virus or CCMV, also the plant virus, with, which is very small in size. Um, if you think about how to make the nanomaterial this small and yet still very stable and well controlled in structure and the surface chemistry is well controlled. It's almost impossible to make like this size homogeneously, like every piece of the nanomaterial is, um, for example, for CCMV is 29 nanometers. So the virus is happened to be naturally like that. And the uh, um, SPV, this is um, already, um, been used in the vaccines uh, production for HPV. So it's a size around 60 nanometer. And you can use the virus-like particle, which I will be focusing on. And uh, the meaning of virus-like particle is just, um, you know, you, you take the virus structure, maybe the, uh, the, the coding structures, and then you, um, you know, purify only some structure of the virus um, for in the in the, most of the case, you are getting rid of the um, genetic materials of the virus because, um, you know, uh, genetic materials can be very, um, very scary for many uh, clinical um, uh, use um, because that, you know, if without the um, extensive study of uh, the results or the human response towards those genetic materials, um, then of course the clinician will not approve uh, for, for the clinical use. And uh, all the virus can be functionalized, of course, because you know the surface of the virus is usually either the lipid molecules or uh, carbohydrates, or uh, most of the time, for example, with the um, plant virus is the code proteins. So um, it can be genetic engineer, it can be bioconjugated, and it can be mineralization or encapsulation of the um, of the molecule of interest. So come to our um, project. Um, you know, we we try to biofunctionalize the VLP with the AZI for antibody conjugation with the click chemistry. So what we do is that um, we uh, try to. Um, modify the surface of the virus with the unnatural molecules like this N3 or AZI um, in order to be, you know, for it to be ready for, to click with the uh, antibody for the easy conjugation and bio orthogonal conjugation. Um, so we start off with the integrating the azide molecules on the host cells of the virus. So we use mammalian cell lines, which is either HEC-293T uh, and Vero cells. And then we decorated, decorated the, um, the cell surface with the N-acetoacetyl manosamine uh, tetraacetylated um, on the surface of the, the cells by easy incorporation of this uh, acido sugar 
in the cell culture media and the cell simultaneously and you know automatically integrate this sugar into its metabolism and then it shows uh, the enzyme molecules on the surface of the cells and after that we express the vector of hiv1 gap protein um, in order to you know mimic the virus transfection but we don't use the, the hiv virus um, itself we just only use the piece of the hiv protein that can be integrated into um into the the, the mammalian cells uh, host cells and then after that we just culture it in the um you know uh, cell culture environment and the um then the virus will and then we purify the virus uh, so the virus that as a result, it will have the envelopes of, of the cell membrane, which was decorated with the um, unnatural, this acido sugar on its surface. So when you have already um, the azide on the surface of the virus, it will be clicked um, with the alkyne, which is stapco here, um, conjugated um, antibodies. So you can decorate the delivery systems, nanomaterials delivery system in the very, um, you know, um, easy methods and uh, without the extensive um, chemical reaction or conjugation. So it's, and this uh, click reaction is very powerful. Okay, so here is the uh, fundamental um, uh, thought of how the, why did we choose the HIV-1 GAC uh, structural protein? And uh, because it's, uh, it's, it can be self-assembled. So this is the in internal um, section of the mammalian cells. And this is the uh, microenvironment of the cells. So this is the cell membrane. So uh, after we can transfect the GAC protein in inside the cells and the PR55 GAC protein will be produced. And then this protein has a special structures that, um, you know, the head group will, will be associated with the inner, um, inner side of the uh, cell membrane. And after it's, the density is good enough, um, the, you know, the surface chemistry is, uh, I mean, the surface, um, uh, tension and surface phenomena itself will will you know give that um, constraint and this um, uh, energy for um, the virus to budding to be budding off the cells membrane and created the uh, nanoparticle with the um, surface of the lipid by layers with the decoration on the surface of the cell. So this is the azi molecules that we are expecting to you know uh, be taken off um, together with the virus particle uh, that was built by the uh, SIV1 GAC uh, PR55 protein. So we could actually use many type of acido sugar that is uh, commercially available. Uh, for example, the uh, Manes or Gaunes um, group or Fugnes and it could be integrated and after it passed the uh, cells um, cells mechanism or cells meta metabolisms, then uh, the, the acido sugar will be integrated on the glycans of the, uh, the cell surface. And, um, you know, this acido sugar can be carried over to the, the virus after the viral infections. And with this, uh, it can be um, you know, used in a lot of applications, um, but we are focusing on drug delivery. So first we try to prove if we have, uh, you know, azide on the cell surface. And uh, uh, so we treat, the cells were treated with the um, uh, acido manes. We actually have two models. First, initially we try to make choline azide. You know, choline is part of the um, uh, uh, phospholipids, right? So we either, um, uh, try to put the um, that acido group on the choline or on the glycan. So with the glycan, we use manes. Either way, we could produce the um, uh, not the virus. I mean, sorry, we could express the uh, azide group on the um, cell surface, 
And this was proven by uh, cross-linking the ASI with the Alexa floor that was uh, labeled with DAPCO, which has the, um, you know, alkyne group here that will be clicked on the cell surface with ASI. And then um, after that, we incorporate the GAC protein with GFP so we can track the, the transfections. And then we could um, initially um, have the uh, ASI expressed on the surface of the, of the cells and the virus. And I'll be um, skipping through these details. So it, I won't um, make the, the extensive um, time usage. So um, we also uh, compare the um, cellular uptakes of the fluorescent label VLP via the ASI alkyne click chemistries. Uh, and we was... No, yeah. no, no, no. Ajahn, ka, uh, uh, wrap up the time a little bit. presenter Okay, uh, how many, how much time do I have right now? Uh, it's like one minute left. Oh, okay, Okay, um, so we 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 was we proved that um the ASI was clicked on the surface of the cells in many uh many cell types and uh and uh it can be internalized into many cell types um the virus itself. So and this is just the three dimensional pictures that uh prove that the virus with ASI can be integrated into the uh, many mammalian cells. Okay, and uh, we already proved the drug loading um, of the uh, uh, virus particle with the ASI decorated surface. And we um, also uh, try to uh, find the mechanism of the uptake of the, this type of virus. And uh, we could uh, summarize the major um, pathway of, uh, you know, Catherine. Uh, mediated endocytosis and the uh, heparin mediated. And we did conjugation with CD3 in because we want to target the Im uh, immuno, um, uh, immune cells uh, for the immunotherapy. Yes, so we successfully um, target the CD3 plus and uh, there's some further studies for the um, loading of genes and try to modify the um, uh, genes in the virus particles. Uh, and the product, products out of this project, we have already published um, and recognized as a he funding with the uh, two research paper and one manuscript in preparation, one review paper in tier one, and also one patent application. And we thank for the Asahi Glass Foundation and Dulalongkorn University funding. And these are my groups. And this is Charlie. Thank you so much. And I will be welcoming all the questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jitima, for your great effort and excellent work. It's, uh, anybody had a, one question for the session? OK. OK. okay. Thank you thank very you, much. Take Thank care. you. Take care. Uh, okay, so I think we're going to move on to, to the last presenter. He's going to come um, by the video presentations. Uh, all right, so we just have a chance to listening to the research about virus. Now we're going to move to the bacteria uh, from uh, Work of associate professor Dr. Dao Suwan Chanjaren uh, from Department of Environmental Engineering, Faculty of Engineering. Uh, she will present in the topic of metal recovery from municipal solid waste fly ash using sulfur dioxide bacteria. Good morning, everyone. I am very pleased to present my recent work on recovery from municipal solid waste fly ash using sulfur oxidizing bacteria. I am Associate Professor Dao Sumasang from the Department of Environmental Engineering, Faculty of Engineering, Chulalongkorn University. And this work is supported by Asahi Glass Foundation Scholarship and also the Center of Excellence in Environmental Engineering, Professor Arun Sarate. Let's begin. This is an overview picture of this work. Basically, this work study how to utilize food waste as a food source for microbial community. 
This isolated culture will be used to remove heavy metals from fly ash. The remediated fly ash can further be used as a material in other industries. This research, this research helped promote zero waste management as well as circular economy. Food is one of the fundamental needs of human beings. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization, or FOA, one third of food is wasted from production until final consumption. Globally, food waste is estimated to be 14%, with Central and Southern Asia accounting for the highest rate of food losses, around 20%, followed by the Northern America and Europe, around 16%. During the COVID-19 pandemic, this number has risen considerably and is predicted to continue to rise and rise. Only a small percentage of these was converted into useful sources and most were disposed of through incineration or composting and landfills. These conventional methods can generate toxic gases and carcinogenic uh, sulfur dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide. These are then potentially released into the atmosphere, which can negatively impact the environment and human life. As we can see in this graph, 6% of global greenhouse gases emission comes from food losses and waste. And according to the EPA or Environmental Protection Agency assessment released in 2021, Food loss and waste in the United States alone include 170 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent greenhouse gases emission, which was equivalent to the yearly carbon dioxide emission of 42 coal fire power plants. According to the latest study from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, food loss and waste accounted for between 8 and 10% of total greenhouse gas emissions. So um, consider the food waste. We are considering the novel ideas, the uses of food waste to offer high nutrition and low cost sources for the culturing of microbes. It can be great for circular economy. Moreover, utilizing food waste helps reduce the disposed load onto the environment. When considering growth media for the cultivation of microbial cultures, the efficiency of the viable cell count is among the most important factors to be considered. Moreover, low-cost media for cultivating microbial cultures include, including food waste and isolated microbial cultures are applied for the biosorption of heavy metals. Fly ash from Various fuel sources is usually disposed of in a landfill. However, this waste can be utilized in many downstream industries, such as construction materials, adsorbents, surfactants, and so on. Yet, some contaminants in fly edge can hinder the recycling process. These contaminants include heavy metals. In our previous work in this table, we remove heavy metals from fly ash usually using chemical processing. Chemical process can be done with cost on contrary. Biological process can be achieved as well as a reduction of food waste. And this leads to our objective of this work to bioremediate heavy metal, uh, contaminated fly edge. And second is to reduce food waste uh, and we use it as a growth media. And third, we study factors that, um, that are compatible for culture growth. The first is to analyze the elements of, uh, in the food waste material. And second, we collect sample, the soil sample from the contaminated area. To third, isolate the multi-metal resistant bacteria culture using the food waste uh, in the first step. And then we optimize the food waste natural medium concentration and other essential parameters. Fifth, we also identify the selected bacteria isolate. And last but not least, we evaluate the multi-metal absorption efficiencies of the isolate. So let's see step by step. So first, we analyze the elements uh, in food waste material. 
There are six food waste that we chose to use. Pig bone waste, seashell, eggshell, watermelon rye, soya bean okra, and chicken bone waste. All of these waste were purchased from the market, fresh market in Thailand in Bangkok, Thailand. And then we analyze for the macro uh, nutrients and micronutrients. We found that the pig bone waste uh, composed of like the highest, um, the macronutrient like carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen, and also sulfur. And you can see that the pig bone waste also consists of um, Phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and iron. And all of these elements are important for the bacterial culture to grow. So in our work, we select pig bone waste as our food waste media. After analysis of the environment of food waste, we collect the soil sample, the contaminated soil sample from different sites, different areas, for example, from the normal soil, like compost soil, soil from garden, soil from uh, the potty soil that you can buy from the, the gun shop to grow plants in, in the garden. And the number four and number five are soil still collected from landfills in, in Thailand, different two sites, and these are the picture. After we um, select food waste, and we collected samples, the soil sampled. We isolated the, the multi-metal resistant bacteria culture in food media. So um, we firstly um, isolate the, the bacterial culture that are resistant to, to from the contaminated soil. And then we grow the isolated culture in the media. So on the left-hand side is the pig medium. You can see some colonies growing. And the left-hand, uh, the right-hand side is the, uh, the nutrition broth, the, um, the broth that we bought from a scientific store. So we can see that for the nutrition broth, a lot of colonies can grow pretty well. And for the pig medium, uh, there are a lot of colony as well that, that can grow. So we picked the colony that can resist the heavy metal and uh, further multiply the colony that we picked for further experiment. And then uh, number four, optimization of food waste, natural medium concentration and other essential parameters. So in this graph, this is the log 10 of the colony of the, the microbial growth uh, per milliliter of, of the media. And on the x-axis that is the media that we use to grow the colony. So you can see that the pig bone media, which has like the highest nutrition, um, has the most colonies of the microbial communities. So this is the reason, another reason why we picked the pig bone uh, food waste. Also on the right hand side is the food waste composition, um, like the element, the, the elemental um, and elements of the food waste composition, aluminum, sodium, magnesium. And we did the experiment in different pH from five to nine and temp different temperature from 25 to 37 with different concentration of food waste sources from 1% to 10%. So this graph is the number five, the fifth step. We identify the selected bacterial isolate with different concentration of heavy metal from zinc, copper, cadmium, lead, chromium, and nickel. The most um, multi Metal tolerant single culture was accessed through a microscopic and biochemical assays. Um, and a microscopic and microscopic identification were determined um, by the electro, sorry, uh, microscopic and microscopic identifications were determined by the microscope. And further, microbial community colonies were identified using 16S rRNA gene sequencing. 
And the last step is to evaluate the multi-metal absorption efficiencies of the isolates. So uh, this is the equation of the, of the absorption capacity and the percent removal. So the percent removal is calculated from the um, concentration or, or the mass of the uh, uh, heavy metal ion removed per the initial concentration of, of the heavy metal. For the result, it's shown that at different um, time and different concentration of the peak bone medium, we can see that the 10% or the brown line uh, has like can give the most um, ha uh, highest optical density or the highest growth of, of the colony. And the time of the peak, we need around one more hour. Uh, one hour to grow the uh, culture to reach the steady state of the growth. So the condition is we selected 10% of the food waste and also around um, 80 minutes growth time. And for the um, pH and the temperature, the uh, maximum the, the optimal pH for the better growth is around seven at the time of 60. And at the temperature, the uh, optimal temperature for the growth uh, is 35 degrees Celsius. So the, at 35 degrees Celsius, the culture grows the best. So the condition that we choose is um, pH seven and temperature at 35 degrees Celsius. And for the bioabsorption efficiencies, we identify that um, the culture. So for the bioabsorption efficiency, we identify um, the species by 16S or RNA. So we found that the um, species is C terre in the uh, that is uh, isolated from the contaminated soil in the pig bone medium. So you can see that the metal percent metal removal of cadmium, chromium, lead, copper, zinc, and nickel are pretty high from around 50 to eight, uh, around 70 percent removal. And all of these metals can be removed simultaneously, or the C terra can uh, bioabsorb, bioabsorb the heavy metal multi-heavy metal at the same time. So in conclusion, this work different food waste. Um, for the conclusions, in this work, different food waste were used for the preparation of media for the cultivation of bacterial cultures. This research identified the selected pig bone waste as a high efficiency and economic medium for bacterial cultures. The batch culture of C. terre showed the growth stability of around 16 days in the pig bone medium. Uh, the isolated C. terre may be an efficient strain for removing heavy metal from contaminated sites, and the pig bone waste medium could be used in microbial growth culture, which require low cost substrates for growing microorganisms in line with modern uh, version of circular economy. And this work was published in Bioresource Technology. And I have to thank, very thankful, Dr. Sunanta Ganesan, who is the first author of this work and is the main person who carry out this work. And this is my research group, PhD students, as well as the uh, researcher. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any question, I will be happy to answer that. So um, anyway, so it's uh, unfortunately we cannot interact with her because yeah, for the technological and distances. But anyway, thank you very much for joining us today. And um, thank you all presenters. Uh, and also thank you for uh, attending the sessions and we hope you will enjoy uh, the exciting research today and definitely uh, this talk will inspire all of us in many ways. And also thank you the organization. 
So um, yeah, and then we're gonna have the lunch together ne in next next room. So um, please uh, enjoy the lunch together, and we can talk more about any kind of. If anybody had any questions, so you will be interact with the presenter in in the lunch room. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, ka.